Hey, I'm here in front of Cheese Teak with owner Jill Erber, and we're talking cheese and regulations. Uh, so I'm here today with uh, Jill Erber, who's the uh, founder and owner of Cheese Teak, which is one of, I think, three or four different locations. Uh, we're, we're here at the oldest location in uh, Alexandria's Del Rey neighborhood, uh, and Jill's been kind enough to sit down and talk about cheese regulations. Uh, uh, upon the heels of publication of my book, by the Hands That Feed Us. Happy to be here. So a couple of years ago, you uh, fought back against uh, prohibition on mimolette, which is uh, an imported cheese. And uh, can you describe what was so controversial about that cheese and also uh, you know, what is permitted in cheese and, and why not uh, mimolette? Sure. So mimolette is um, a very old, traditional French cheese. It's a very hard-aged cheese, and it looks exactly like a brown bowling ball. It's perfectly round, makes it impossible to cut, FYI. But um, it's a round cheese, and the, one of the natural parts of, of developing and aging a wheel of mimolette is that it is covered in um, microscopic cheese mites that help to actually aerate the rind. They keep it nice and light and fluffy and semi-permeable such that air can enter the cheese. And it's actually this wonderful, amazing symbiosis between these little um, microscopic critters and the cheese itself. And so this cheese has been made for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and imported into the United States for decades. And then all of a sudden, um, a couple years ago, the FDA cracked down on importing this cheese, saying that the number of mites per square inch exceeded their threshold. So this is concerning in two ways. First of all, the fact that the FDA actually has regulations dictating the number of mites per square inch on a wheel of cheese. Like, where does that even come from? Um, and secondly, that, um, that this cheese had exceeded that. And, you know, we laughed about it a little bit and, oh, how silly is, is that regulation? And, oh, how, how odd and what a... Um, but really, it was a devastating uh, impact to those producers of that cheese. Uh, the United States was um, a huge importer of that cheese. Their shipments of those cheeses from France were being held on a dock in New Jersey, I believe, or New York, um, literally sitting in a container, rotting. Um, so the entire time that everyone was going back and forth talking about this issue, um, there were, were real stakes uh, at play. So there was massive loss of product, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it, what it really did is it created kind of this fear of um, uh, what what will happen next, and in the sense of, that a, a cheese maker doesn't have any control over whether his quality product will ever make it to market, and whether it will be destroyed on a dock somewhere. So um, it turned into quite a, a big uproar. People got very upset on many different levels about this issue, and not only because of the, the, the ludicrousness of, uh, of, of the nature of sort of mites on rind uh, in a traditional cheese making process that had been like that for, for hundreds of years, um, and the fact that we will allow so many truly dangerous and unhealthy uh, things to enter our food supply, uh, and, um, and yet that got the attention of the FDA somehow. So, uh, so, uh in this country, it's very difficult to buy true raw milk cheeses. Uh, why are the rules so different here than they are in many countries, and, and why is that bad for uh, sellers and consumers? Raw milk cheeses, um, one of the wonderful things about them, important to understand, is that because they are made from unpasteurized milk, they have all these wonderful sort of bacteria and enzymes and things within them that make each cheese unique and special and very reflective of the land and the animal and the climate um, from where the cheese comes. So it's a really interesting way to always taste something different in your cheese. Uh, when we pasteurize our cheeses, we kill the vast majority of those wonderful bacteria and destroy those enzymes. And so the cheeses end up uh, typically being a little less interesting in flavor and less reflective of where the cheese comes from. So the United States is very strict with regard to the raw milk cheeses here. Again, they have to be aged for two full months. And, um, and I think it really puts the public at a disadvantage because it's a shame that we can't get those delicious, squishy uh, raw milk cheeses here. The FDA uh, cracked down on uh, ripening cheese on wooden boards, which is an ancient practice that's been around, I believe, for as long as cheese has been made by human beings. Probably. Uh, so for thousands of years. Why do you think the FDA did that, and why would that have been a huge problem for you and your business? 
So I truly don't know what triggered uh, the FDA's response to that. I don't know if it was one isolated case and then they went, oh, that's that's odd. Why is that happening? And, and maybe it was just bred from ignorance about cheese making. Um, I don't know what initially sort of stimulated the FDA's interest in that, but it, they, they ended up having to, to backpedal a little bit because people immediately uh, went into such an uproar um, for fear of their artisan cheeses. Again, these are cheeses that are made in smaller batches by actual human beings um, and, and stored in facilities that are as um, sort of authentic as possible. And, uh, and so people were really, really disturbed by the prospect of this sort of random um, application of a regulation that was unclear, unable to predict, when would it happen, when would it not happen, it just scared people. So I think that's really what it came down to. We talked a little bit about uh, Mimolet, and maybe people aren't familiar with that cheese, but can you name some of the cheeses that under these proposed FDA uh, rules uh, regarding ripening on wooden boards that, that were threatened that I think some of these names might be familiar to oh, people? I mean, a huge number of, of very popular cheeses are aged on wood boards. This is not some sort of like retro, funky um, uh, return to the original thing. You know, Parmigiano Reggiano, the most popular cheese in the world, one of the most recognized cheeses in the world, the king of cheeses uh -huh, from Italy is aged on wooden boards. Um, Taleggio, another Italian cheese, which is considered the most ancient um, washed rind cheese in the world. It's been around for thousands of years. This cheese is aged on wooden boards. Um, tons of Goudas. Gouda is one of the most beloved styles of cheese in the world. There are thousands of different kinds of Goudas from all over the world. Um, and those are aged on wood boards when they're made in the traditional way. So the number of cheeses that are not made <laughs> and aged on cheese board, I'm sorry, the number of cheeses that are not aged on wood boards is actually smaller than you might think. It's a very, very common practice for small cheesemakers and huge cheesemakers as well. Great. Um, well, I want to thank you very much, Jill, for uh, taking time to uh, talk about food regulations and, and their impact, and uh, this has really been wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, if people are interested in learning more about food regulations and how they often uh, uh, infringe upon people's uh, sustainable food practices and habits uh, and make eating less uh, tasty and wonderful, uh, I encourage them to pick up a copy of my book, Biting the Hands That Feed Us, How Fewer, Smarter Laws Would Make Our Food System More Sustainable.